Okay, we're good to go. Okay, so we can start now. So welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this, um, this session on perception in augmented reality. So we have five presentations to hear, and then we will have time for some questions. So please use the dedicated uh, Discord channel uh, to send your questions. And then we will, after, we will answer all the questions after all the presentations. So without further delay, we can start with our first uh, presentation uh, from Denis Kahl from the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. Denise, you can start. Okay. You see my slides? Yes. So then, um, yeah, hello. Um, as already said, my name is Denise Karl, and together with my co authors, Marco Bley and Antonio Krüger, we investigated the influence of environmental lighting on possible size variations in optical see through tangible augmented reality. When using physical objects for tangible interaction with their virtual counterparts, the best experience would be achieved when interacting with exact matching physical replica, but producing and storing this large amount of physical props is not feasible. Therefore, physical props need to be identified that are suitable for multiple use cases and can represent a large number of virtual objects. However, this would result in potential visual discrepancies between the physical and virtual object, for example, regarding shape, size, and texture. In a previous study, we investigated to what extent a physical prop can differ in size from its virtual counterpart. The study took place in a darkened and only dimly lit room, and we used wide virtual overlays, which had maximum opacity so that the physical objects behind were nearly not visible. With this setup, the results were very similar to those from size variation studies in virtual reality and also video see-through augmented reality. Um, so small size differences were not reliably detectable. A variation in size was possible without significant worsening of disturbance and presence. And the size variation range was wider for virtual objects larger than the physical object. Finally, we found no influence of size variation on performance. Ericsson et al. found that the contrast of the HoloLens 1 and HoloLens 2 decreases with increasing illuminance. We therefore expected that the environmental illuminance would also affect the visual perception of the virtual and physical objects, and hence the extent to which the physical objects may differ in size from the virtual representation. And as can be seen in the right picture, we expected that the reduced contrast would cause participants to perceive the virtual objects as transparent thus making the physical objects more visually prominent. We therefore wanted to find out how this affects possible size variation ranges in brighter lighting. So we made up a new study where we examined possible size variations between the virtual and physical object in three different lighting conditions. And this time we used white physical props with medium blue virtual overlays. We experienced in pretests that this combination leads to different perceptions in each lighting condition. Condition dark corresponds most closely to our previous study, where the overlays nearly almost hide the physical props behind. In condition medium, we have a balance between the intensity of the virtual overlay and the physical object. And in condition bright, the physical object is in the focus. All participants had to perform the same task for each size condition at each environmental illumination. So the participants had to arrange three virtual objects on their corresponding virtual targets in the back of a plate. When a target was placed accurately enough, it turned green. And as soon as all overlays were placed correctly, another three targets appeared in the front area of the plate. And when all virtual objects were accurately placed, the task was finished and the time measurement stopped. We performed the study in a darkened room, which was only illuminated with lamps to ensure the same conditions for each participant. 24 participants took part in our study, which lasted about 90 minutes. A within subjects design was used, so every participant had to solve the task 21 times. And we both balanced the order of the lighting conditions and the order of the size conditions. In addition to measuring the time for completing tasks, we used questionnaires to evaluate the study. 
After each task, the participants had to answer three to four short questionnaires consisting of three to four questions each. All of these questionnaires were rated using seven point Likert scales and were presented in augmented reality as overlays on the table. With the help of a tangible pen, the participants were able to set their choices and go back and forth between the questions. The AR presence questionnaire evaluated how realistic the overlays in the respective task appeared, and the tangible AR presence questionnaire evaluated how realistic the interaction with the virtual objects felt. In the size perception questionnaire, the size differences between the virtual and physical object were evaluated, for example, with respect to confusion during grasping. After finishing a lighting condition, additionally, a lighting questionnaire had to be answered. In this questionnaire, besides rating how transparent the overlays felt, the participants had to evaluate the naturalness of the environmental lighting in the just experienced lighting condition. Finally, the participants received a final paper questionnaire asking for demographic information and additionally for a ranking of the lighting conditions. We determined some overall results regarding the comparison between the different lighting conditions. As expected, the overlays were perceived more transparent in the bright lighting condition. Also, the task completion time slightly increased with increasing illumination. Furthermore, brighter illumination was perceived more natural and tended to be more pleasant. In contrast to that, with increasing illuminance, AR presence and tangible AR presence got worse, and grasping and interacting with the overlays felt more and more disturbing. This figure shows the results of our study for the individual size conditions. On the left, you can see the measures we looked at. The blue bars in the middle indicate the range, which in which there was no significant difference between the particular size condition and the base condition M or the different lighting conditions. Significant differences are marked with one, two, or three stars based on their significance level. The estimation of the size of the virtual object compared to the size of the physical object was difficult for small size variations. Regarding AR and tangible AR presence, bigger size differences are possible without significantly worsening the ratings in the bright lighting. With increasing illumination, the size variation range becomes larger without a significant degradation of the disturbance scores. Furthermore, in our study setup, the environmental lighting only had an effect on the task completion time in the dark condition, where the performance was significantly worse in condition XXS and XXL. From the results of the study, we can conclude that the environmental illuminance influences the visual perception of the virtual objects. The visual perception also has an influence on the size range in which a physical object can differ from its virtual counterpart. With increasing brightness, these ranges become larger so that it is possible to work with even larger or smaller objects compared to the virtual object. And we found that presence and usability decrease with increasing illuminance. Overall, we can say that it is possible to vary the size of the physical representation in all investigated lighting conditions without strongly degrading presence, visibility, and performance. But further studies are needed to investigate other feature differences, for example, regarding shape or texture. Thank you. Thank you, Denise, for this very interesting presentation. Um, we will now continue with our second uh, presentation from Heli Adams from Vanderbilt University. Heli, you can start. You should unmute yourself and then start. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction, Etienne. I am. Uh, my name is Haley Adams, and I'm a PhD candidate in computer science at Vanderbilt University. And today, I am happy to present my work titled "Depth Perception in AR: The um, The Effects of Display, Shadow, and Position," uh, which was conducted under the tutelage of Bobby Bodenheimer, Sarah Kremerger, and Janine Stepanucci. So at present, we have evidence that augmented reality head-mounted displays can influence people's perception of space, but we don't completely understand how or why this happens, which is a problem because many of the applications for augmented reality require accurate spatial perception. 
As such, our goal for this project was to better understand how the type of AR display and the way virtual objects are presented in these displays affect people's depth perception judgments. As a fun aside, before the conference started, I posted an informal poll on Twitter and asked people uh, which display type they thought would permit more accurate spatial perception, and the outcome was a tie. So for our investigation, we used the Microsoft HoloLens 2, an optical see-through display, and the Vario XR3, a video see-through display. Both devices are state-of-the-art for their respective display categories. The Vario XR3 is a video see-through display with a weight of 980 grams and a field of view of approximately 115 by 90 degrees. In contrast, the Microsoft HoloLens 2 is a lightweight optical see-through display that provides a full unobstructed view of the real world, but only has an augmented field of view of approximately 43 by 29 degrees. I have a more detailed breakdown of the differences between these displays in the paper, but for the sake of today's discussion, I want to mention these two specifications, because although we do not directly manipulate weight and field of view in the study, prior research in virtual reality HMDs has shown that weight and field of view contribute to depth underestimation. Um, there's also some evidence that people's depth judgments in video see-through and optical see-through AR are similarly underestimated um, within action space, which covers a range of distances between two and 30 meters. Um, but few of these studies directly compared um, perception between different AR head-mounted displays, which complicates comparisons across studies for a number of reasons. In our study, we also looked at the height of virtual targets in AR. For applications, developers may present virtual objects as floating above the ground, uh, to make gazing at overlays more comfortable. Uh, for example, Google Maps AR and the infamous RoboRaid do this. And perhaps because of this, much of the prior research investigating depth perception in AR has used floating virtual targets alone for assessment. And we believe the decision to evaluate floating targets alone may have an undesired effect on people's depth judgments in these studies. And because the human visual system treats floating objects as though they are located on the ground plane, but typically they perceive it as farther away without um, information otherwise. Uh, we also look at cast shadows because prior research in completely virtual environments has shown that this effect of optical contact uh, can be mitigated when surface contact cues like cast shadows are present. Uh, motivated by these findings, a growing body of research in depth perception in AR has also looked at how the presence of cast shadows can influence relative depth judgments when virtual targets are floating. But thus far, none of this research has evaluated judgments to grounded targets, which makes it impossible to interpret the relationship between cast shadow and height above the ground with these studies alone. So given this prior research, we developed four hypotheses. First, targets will be underestimated in both AR displays. Second, when a shadow is present, people's distance judgments would be underestimated less. Third, there would be an interaction between shadow and target height such that there will be a difference between floating and grounded objects without a shadow, but no difference when shadow is present. Um, lastly, because weight and field of view are known factors for distance underestimation in virtual reality, we predicted that the video see-through display would induce more distance underestimation than the optical see-through display. So to address our hypotheses, we utilized a within subjects vectorial design with display, shadow shading, target height, and target distance as factors. Distance judgments were obtained through an absolute measure of distance perception, verbal report, and targets were presented at three, 4.5, and six meters. Uh, we also utilized a two by two by two by three within subjects vectorial design uh, for display, shadow shading, target height, and target distance respectively. Distance judgments were obtained. Um, oh, sorry, I'm repeating myself. We reduced potential learning effects between display conditions by moving participants to the opposite side of the room uh, for the second part of the study. Um, we then used a linear mix, uh, mixed effects model to investigate the influence of shadow, target height, and device on people's depth judgments. Um, our results showed that distance judgments across both displays were underestimated, a finding that supports our first hypothesis. 
This result reinforces a growing body of literature in ARHMDs that has found distance estimates in action space to be underestimated. In support of H4, we found that participants were more accurate at estimating distances in the HoloLens 2 than in the Vario XR3, with an average of about 15% underestimation in the HoloLens 2 and 20% underestimation in the Vario XR3. Based on VR literature, it's possible that this difference was influenced by weight and field of view differences between the two HMDs. But this theory will need more research to confirm. We also found a significant effect of shadow presence or absence on depth judgments, which confirms H2, in which we predicted that cast shadows would improve depth perception. Our experiment did not, however, find an interaction of height and shadow as we'd hypothesized. However, we did see a main effect of height. Two interpretations of this result are possible. Uh, first, it may be that people found it more difficult to assess floating targets in general, regardless of the presence of a cast shadow. This, res uh, this result is in line with research in video see-through displays by Kaito et al, which found that people's confidence in depth judgments were worse for floating targets that were higher above the ground, in their case, half a meter versus a meter. Um, alternatively, verbal report measures are known to be more variable than other distance measures, and they can be susceptible to anchoring effects. Given that the magnitude of the effect of cast shadows we see here is smaller than expected, it's possible that the lack of interaction here was due to the use of verbal report in our experiment. In future research, it will be beneficial then to look at floating targets that are positioned higher above the ground and to explore additional measures of depth perception judgments since different measures for depth rely on different perceptual representations. In conclusion, people underestimated distances in both displays and distance underestimation was more severe in the Vario XR3 than the Microsoft HoloLens 2. And although we found effects of both shadow and height as perceptual theory and previous work would predict, we did not find the predicted interaction between object height and the presence of cast shadow, which is a fruitful topic for future investigation. Thank you for listening to my presentation. I look forward to your questions at the end of the session. Back to you, Etienne. Thank you. Th thank you, Ellie. Thank you for this uh, presentation. Um, so we'll just switch to our next uh, speaker. Next speaker is Alexander Marquardt from Bonn-Rensink University of Applied Sciences. So I hope you can see my presentation now and yeah, hear me. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yes, welcome to the presentation of our TVCG submission with the title uh, Multisensory Proximity and Transition Cues um, uh, for Improving Target Awareness in Narrow Field of View Augmented Reality Displays. My name is Alexander Marquardt, and this is a collaborative work between bonn sieg University, the University of Bremen, and Osnabrück University in Germany, and the NARA Institute of Science uh, and Technology in NARA, Japan. So first we begin with a brief introduction. Um, augmented reality applications allow users to enrich their real surroundings with digital content, but due to the limited field of view of augmented reality devices, it can be difficult to become aware of newly emerging information inside or outside the field of view. So um, in this paper, we evaluate how multisensory cue combinations can improve the awareness for moving uh, out of view targets, especially for a narrow field of view AR devices. We, uh, we distinguish between proximity and transition cues in either visual, auditory, or tactile manner. Um, and proximity cues are intended to enhance spatial awareness of approaching out of view objects, while transition cues are there to inform the user that the object just entered the field of view of the device. Overall, we perform two user studies, which we will discuss in detail on the next slides. Um, about the main task for both user studies uh, consisted of being aware of an invisible AR out of view object that approaches the field of view and enters it after some time, uh, either from the left or the right side. Then uh, combined multi-sensory multi proximity and transition cues will be used to inform the user about the approaching object and the transition into the field of view. Uh, the task was performed under two different noise conditions. Firstly, uh, reduced noise with a minimum of visual and auditory distraction. And secondly, an increased noise condition, which includes some visual noise, optical flow, and auditory noise, 
as can be seen on the figures on the right side. Furthermore, in study two, uh, implements a divided attention task uh, for the secondary task users were required to respond to a specific centrally presented uh, visual stimulus. Uh, in our case, uh, next to the main task, the user had to react to a specific number uh, that was shown in the central area of the field of view. In terms of the feedback design, our method combines uh, proximity and transition cues to an overall feedback we call modes, and modes fall always a fixed order. So firstly, um, uh, the proximity queue is shown as long as the um, AR object is located out of view to provide about the spatial information about the AR object. And as soon as the object touches the border of the field of view, a short transition queue informs about the transitioned AR object into the field of view. And please note that the that we use the following notation for modes. Uh, first, the name of the modality that represents the proximity queue, and uh, second, the name of the modality that represents the transition queue, for example, audio tactile and audio visual, and so on. So, cues can be presented in either visual, auditory, or tactile manner. Um, and to enable tactile feedback, we created a custom made headband with um, two vibration motors placed on minus 45 degree and 45 degree from the user's point of view. Um, beginning with the auditory proximity cues, which is number one on the figure below, um, the virtual object emits uh, a continuous spatial sound as long as the object is located out of view. Um, for visual proximity, uh, which is number two, we used Atroda method. Here, the information is represented as a proxy symbol that moves analogous to the uh, real object uh, across the Atroda border. And regarding transition cues, auditory tra uh, transition, which is uh, number three in the picture, uh, triggers a short notification sound as soon as the virtual object touches the border of the field of view. Um, visual transition uh, number four highlights the proxy, proxy symbol in red color on the edge radar border. And lastly, tactile transition provides a short vibration burst on the corresponding side of the tactile headband. Um, in study one, we examined user preference of uh, all cue combinations for over six different feedback modes, including visual and audio proximity cues and visual, auditory, and tactile transition cues. Um, preference were examined under conditions of reduced and increased noise, and um, six modes competed uh, against each other in the course of a pairwise comparisons. The users had to choose which mode was preferred with regard to raising awareness for out-of-view objects and the transition into the field of view. Uh, results showed that in general, bimodal cues, which combined cues of different modalities, uh, received higher preference scores than unimodal cues that um, that combined only cues of the same modality. Also, modes with tactile transition were preferred under noise conditions. For the performance study, we used only the most preferred modes from study one, namely audio tactile mode AT, visual tactile mode VT, and um, uh, visual audio mode VA. Uh, so all these modes uh, showed a high preference across noise conditions in the first user study. And in order to mimic real-world application conditions, we uh, used in the study this divided attention task to measure performance. So uh, for task one, the user was told to use the feedback modes to indicate the direction of the incoming object and react in the moment of transition. And for, study, uh, for task two, users were required to respond to a visual stimulus as described before. As in study one, uh, study two was performed under conditions of reduced and increased noise, um, uh, visual and auditory noise. And the result showed a faster reaction of uh, visual tactile and audio tactile mode compared to the visual audio mode in both noise conditions. And also we found a uh, slowdown in reaction times um, in the increased noise condition for modes that incorporate visual proximity feedback, but interestingly, not for the audio tactile mode. So to summarize the conclusions for both performed user studies, um, overall preference and performance results showed that users can effectively use proximity and transition cues to improve their awareness for incoming out of view targets. And also subjective feedback uh, provided after each study supported these findings. Uh, preference of bimodal cues that um, suggests that the good discriminability of cues is beneficial for perception. Moreover, when noise is present that blocks one perceptual channel, another sensory channel is still free. Um, high 
performance in a secondary task for all tested modes demonstrate that the usage, usage of proximity and transition queues leaves sufficient cognitive capacities free to perform concurrent tasks. The stronger impairment of visual cues compared to auditory cues uh, during increased noise conditions also showed that audio noise is manageable with a good design of auditory cues. And also we showed uh, um, a high usefulness of tactile transition cues in noisy environments, which underlines the noticeable yet unintrusive character of tactile feedback. So further information and the full source code of the project is available on GitHub. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alexander, for your presentation. Um, I remind the audience that you can ask questions in the dedicated uh, Discord channel and that we uh, will ask the question after all the presentation. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mohamed Safaya Terafin from Mississippi State University. Okay. Can, can you see the slide? Yes, perfect. Okay. Great. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Mohammed Safaid Arifin. I'm a PhD candidate from Computer Science and Engineering Department of Mississippi State University. And here I'm going to present the paper, The Effect of Context Switching, Focal Distance Switching, Binocular and Monocular Viewing, and Transient Focal Blur on Human Performance in Optical C through Augmented Reality. Here are the authors of the paper. And let's start with the problem statement. So we all know that in optical see through augmented reality system, information is distributed between the real and virtual information. And sometimes it appears at different distances from the user. Therefore, it brings three air interface design issues, context switching, focal distance switching, and transient focal blur. So let's start with the context switching. Context switching means switching visual and cognitive attention between the real and virtual information. So if you look at these pictures, you can see that a person is performing a maintenance task while in an HMD, and he needs to switch his visual and cognitive attention to perform this duty properly. Also, focal distance switching means switching between two focal distances to see information in sharp focus. So if you look at these pictures, these pictures are taken from a YouTube video where a person using a Google Glass and walking in an urban street. What we observe is that when a person focuses on the foreground, his background information becomes blur. And when he focuses on the background, his foreground air information becomes blur. So in order to get information from both environment, he needs to continuously switch his eye focus back and forth. And the amount he needs to switch is the focal distance, switching distance amount. What we also observe is that during focal distance switching, and if this continuous switching is going on, user can observe only one information in focus and other information becomes blur for a very short amount of time. And we term this as a transient focal blur. Previously, Gavard, Mehra, and Swan, they investigated these issues using a nomad microvision air display and text-based visual search task. And they found that there's a significant negative effect of context switching on task performance and eye fatigue in uh, both context switching and focal distance switching. However, they express their concern is that maybe these findings are wrongly related to their experimental display. Therefore, they call for the replication of this study in their research. Therefore, we set up our research goal. Our research goal is to systematically investigate this optical see-through air display issues by partially replicating and extending the task that is previously reported by Gavard, Mayer, and so on on a very different air display, which is a custom-built air haploscope. Our second goal is to fully understand our experimental, finds, experimental findings from the vision science perspective. So based on this research goal, we set up our hypothesis. Our first hypothesis is that context switching would reduce performance and increase eye fatigue. Our second hypothesis is that larger focal switching distance would reduce performance and increase eye fatigue. Our third hypothesis is that consistent with the previous findings, this transient focal blur effect would further reduce the performance and it will be found in across all the condition of context switching and focal distance switching. In order to explore our research goal and hypothesis, we considered our custom built air haploscope as our experimental display. And we considered and adapted the text based visual search task from Cavard, Mehra, and Swan. And here each task has a five subtask and we have a time pressure of 25 seconds. Let me explain explain one of the subtasks here. Here, at first user need to switch his eye focus to the left X and need to find out the target letter. The target letter is the side-by-side -side identical letters. 
Here, the target letter is O. After gathering the target letters, participant needs to switch his eye focus to the right text and count it how many times it appears on the right text. And here, answer is one. After getting the uh, answer, participant need to provide the answer on a numeric keypad. This task allows the participants to forcefully gather information from both of real left text and the right text, which allows us to uh, experiment both real and air different conditions in our experiment. We have five, four experimental variables in our, ex, uh, in our research. First, context switching, focal switching distance, viewing, and repetition. Context switching no and yes. Context switching no means participant viewed both information real and the both information presented on a physical monitors. And context switching yes means one information is real, another information is air, which is presented through the air haploscope. Focal switching distance is the function of the test distance and reference distance. And from this equation, we found have four different amount of focal switching distance amount. We have a viewing conditions, monocular and the binocular viewing. Monocular viewing, participants perform the task with their dominant eye and cover the non-dominant eye with their eye patch. And under the binocular condition, participants perform the experiment with both eyes open. And each, each of the variables repeated five times. Here's the overall experimental setup of our research. We have 24 participants in our experiment and the mean age of the participants was 22.9 years. And all the variables in our uh, study properly counterbalance. We consider within subject experimental design where each participant perform 180 tasks. Note that each task has also five subtasks. Let's look at our analysis. In our analysis, we have used multiple regression method and if you want to know more about that, you can look at the Pethauser chapter 12. So let's start off uh, with the results of context switching on human performance. Here's the results of, our, of the context switching on performance. Here the x-axis showing the reference distance, which is one of our continuous independent variable. Y-axis showing the number of subtasks, which we measured from our experiment. We have another categorical independent variable is here, which is context switching, yes and no. And multiple linear regression finds the best linear feed for each of the panels. Let's start with the leftmost column. This is finding from the cavern mirror and so on, and they use a nomad display and semi-binocular conditions. And what they found is that there's a significant negative effect of context switching. However, we have considered the monocular conditions with our AR haploscope, and we didn't find any effect of context switching in our research, but we found that increasing reference distance resulted in various performance. But under the binocular conditions, we didn't find any effect of context switching and the reference distance. When we considered the eye fatigue, we found that context switching increased the eye fatigue in across all the condition, but the magnitude of this increasing eye fatigue is different. Here's the result of focal switching distance. And if you look at the x-axis, you can see, it, see the different amount of focal switching distance here. What we found is that as the amount of focal switching distance increased, participant performance decreased, and monocular viewing decreased performance more than the binocular viewing, and we didn't find the context switching effect on the during the focal switching distance analysis. In terms of eye fatigue, we found that increasing focal switching distance resulted in greater eye fatigue, and context switching did increase the eye fatigue in both monocular and binocular viewing. Now here we are considering monocular and binocular viewing directly, consider all the data and compare each of the panel. What we found is that task performance were higher and under binocular viewing and under the, uh, related to the closer distance compared to the monocular viewing conditions and the far distances. Also, when we consider the eye fatigue, we found that binocular viewing was much more comfortable and much more less fatiguing compared to the monocular viewing and increasing reference distance resulted in greater fatigue. Here is the interesting results of our experiment. This is the if results of transient focal blur. And what we found is a significant interaction effect of focal distance switching and whether there is a targeter in the first end of the text or not. It means that due to this effect, participant missed the target letter on the first line. Interesting fact is that we found this letter, we found this effect across all the conditions of the experiment and which has replicated the results of the previous findings. And the, but, uh, but interesting thing is that this findings is not specific to the AR. This is a general property of the visual search task where subjects needs to integrate information both from two digital displays. Therefore, 
We found that there is no context switching effect on the task performance, but it did increase the eye fatigue, which partially support our hypothesis one. We found that as focal switching distance increased, performance decreased and eye fatigue increased, which fully support our hypothesis two. We found that transient focal bar resulting in reduced task performance under all combination of context and binocular viewing conditions in our experiment, which fully support our hypothesis three. And in terms of the vision, pers vision science perspective, we found that binocular viewing is much more comfortable, increased performance, and it has less fatigue. In future, we want to consider the age effect backgrounds effect in the experiment. We want to include an eye tracker in our experiment to uh, track the eye movements during the switching task. That's all from my part. Uh, thank you. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, we'll switch to our next and last uh, speaker uh, with uh, Wolfgang Andreas Meringer from Friedrich Alexander Universitat in Ringland, Nuremberg. Perfect. Thank you for that kind introduction. And I will present the work uh, Stereopsis Only Validation of Monocular Depth Cues Reduced Gamified Virtual Reality with Reaction Time Measurement. And as you might all know, of course, Stereopsis described our visual depth perception based on binocular depth cues, so the different perspective of our two eyes. And this helps us to, for example, play tennis and identify the position of the ball so we can hit it. And now in the absence of binocular depth cues, the performance of visual motor tasks is limited. And one reason for the absence might be amblyopia, which is a developmental disorder of the visual system caused by a squint or a severe refraction error. And this leads to the loss of stereopsis. The gold standard was and still is patching of the healthy eye, but there are a lot of issues. Most importantly, stereopsis improvements are often poor because it is a monocular treatment. That's why uh, binocular approaches are coming up and the idea is to compensate uh, squints and to equalize the image quality of both eyes to enable them to work together. And the actual uh, training based on these compensations is best realized as a repetitive task. And so this talk will be about um, the validation of our approach to a stereopsis training. Now in literature, we found various implementations. Um, here only two of them. Uh, first of all, an ego shooter game tested on 23 adults with amblyopia showing improved uh, stereopsis after playing 40 hours. And a virtual reality system in which a spaceship uh, here is visible to one eye and rings that must be hit are visible to the other eye. And in eight of 17 participants, improvements in stereopsis could be shown. Yet there is no purely stereoscopic and repetitive task available. So some um, do not have a specific repetitive task and some uh, show distinct images per eye, um, which is no stereoscopic task at all. So we wanted to find out whether it is possible to create a purely stereoscopic task in a repetitive game. And for that, we created a virtual environment with minimized uh, monocular depth cues, and we conducted a study to validate them. For the virtual environment, we used the HTC Vive Pro, and the stimulus consists of a ball falling from the ceiling, and when the ball hits the plane at the end of the table, two balls are spawned jumping towards the user. And as you can see here in the GIF, um, shadows are not rendered, and the two balls do not overlap. But the adaption of the size uh, of the balls and their trajectory will be explained in the following slides. First of all, I want to explain the stereoscopic task itself. So the two balls have different distances to the user, here represented as the angles spanned with the two eyes, so alpha and beta, and they are so-called disparities and given seconds of arc. And um, for us, we also define the level of difficulty in the stereoscopic task with disparity differences that have to be constant while the balls are moving towards the user. For better visualization, um, I will only rely on the distance um, V between the balls instead of the disparity differences. Now imagine one of the balls is directly on the line of sight uh, and the object spans a viewing angle. Now, as we said, the other ball is ahead and spans a larger viewing angle. The difference in the viewing angles is a monocular depth cube. The solution is, of course, to scale down the ball ahead to an extent that it fits the viewing angle uh, of the other ball. Now, imagine the balls are not exactly on the line of sight, but elevated in the C direction to the same amount in such a scenario as a tennis game. And there again, we have a difference in the viewing angles that we can perceive monocularly. The solution would be to move down the ball 
uh, the balls onto the same viewing angle, ensuring that the distance um, fits the disparity difference. And if we look from above, the same issue arises for the XY plane because of the distance between the balls to avoid overlapping. Again, we could shift um, one ball, ensuring the correct distance. However, of course, instead of looking at the planes independently, we best apply the correction in 3D space. So we apply the defined distance to the reference ball, retrieve the point along the ball's vector, and finally mirror the point along the forward vector of the initial position of the user, which gives us the position of the adapted ball. To validate our method, we conducted a study with 18 participants. At the beginning, we tested their visual characteristics and we applied um, uh, different contrasts to one eye. So 100% here is um, normal vision denoted as max. So both eyes receive the same image quality and then 1% or low and 0% or min, which is monocular vision. And within one contrast setting, uh, three disparity differences were tested. Uh, repeated 28 times, and the participant's task was to hit the closer ball with this tennis racket. The data we acquired um, was the reaction time from the ball hitting the plane until one ball was hit by the player, and whether the correct ball was hit or not. Now, if we look at the reaction times of only the correct responses, we can see that there is a general decrease in the time from the lowest to the highest disparity, that's what we expected. However, if we compare the 275 arc seconds in the different contrast settings, we can see that there is only a small difference in the median. That is something we did not expect. An explanation could be a seeding effect introduced by the task design itself. So the average flight time of the balls from hitting the plane to reaching the, uh, the user is just about one second, enforcing a reaction within this time frame. And thus, all reaction times result in the same range. Now, if we look at the accuracy, we can see that there is a general uh, increase in the accuracy from the lowest to the highest uh, disparity, what we again expected. And if we again compare the 275 arc seconds in the different contrast settings, we can see that there is a general decrease of accuracy with a decrease in contrast, which we also expected. However, we would expect even lower accuracy values here, especially for the um, minimum contrast, because if we imagine that the task is fully a stereoscopic and we show a 0% image contrast to one eye, it is basically a 50% chance to hit the correct ball. So to come back to my research questions, um, is it possible to create a purely stereoscopic task in a repetitive game? I would say yes, but we assume that the user doesn't move the head too much because we know that motion parallax is still enabled. Uh, there is literature on how uh, to disable it, and we will investigate them further. The study was conducted to validate the game with participants that are able to perceive depth to prove that the system delivers purely stereoscopic tasks, but we cannot make any statements about the system for embryos. In future, um, we want um, also uh, to use other standalone hardware to offer the system for usage at home. Nevertheless, we believe that we created a good method for stereopsis training, which will soon be ready to be tested on ambient. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. So I think we, uh, yeah, we have plenty of time for some questions. So we'll go back in time and start with our first uh, speaker and while I gather some questions from Discord. So the first question is from Kyoshi Kyokawa. He asked, um, what was the color and reflectance of the proxy objects? Uh, and what about painting the objects with the ultra black and low reflectance ink to minimize the depressions, the depress, the discrepancy, sorry, between the object and the virtual object? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so in the study we conducted, we um, did not want to have um, black props um, and um, really choose to have uh, the props uh, colored in white and use these medium blue overlays so that we really have the three different um, perceptions in our lighting um, conditions. So if we would have used 
um, black props like in our previous study, then the overlay would always have been in the focus and um, I, we would really have ne needed a, a really a high um, illuminance in the room to really get a, a black prop which is behind in the focus of, of, of the overlay. So um, that we, we wouldn't have been able to do the study we, we did. <laughs> mainly the, the reason yeah thank you um i don't think you have other question from discord but i have some uh in fact what when you look to the movement of the participants did they try to grab the always the prop the physical prop or did they try to grab the virtual object and maybe after uh adjust their movement what was their movement in fact um yeah <laughs> so um uh, sure they they always uh, it depends on the lighting conditions so um in in the dark lighting where you really um, almost only see the virtual um overlay and um this one is is very small they they really um yeah uh, the other way around if it's really big they really grab into it and it's uh, sometimes confusing but then if they have it in their hand and and uh, can can move it then it's no problem anymore and um we also from the results we also think uh, that uh, somehow the participants uh, learned a little bit um by time so that they were not that irritated anymore when they did that more often Okay, and do you think that this difference between small or big uh, can explain the difference in your results be between uh, big and small uh, virtual objects when the well the big the bigger object was better than the small ones? Um, I guess uh, the the range was the range was a uh, greater for for the bigger objects. Um, yeah, maybe this is also one of the reasons um but yeah i guess the the small the small overlays were really really small and i guess this is also a reason why this may not have worked that well yeah okay thank you thank you for your presentation for your uh, answer um if there is more question on the discord you can use uh, it to exchange and we'll go to our next presentation so as a presentation from ellie adams ellie so i we have a bunch of question i guess i can discord. parse down through it i might have already kind of answered some of them in chat they're, they're all kind of um, yeah, yeah, if you don't mind i can dive in um, yeah, a lot of the you can you can, really... you can choose the one you prefer if you like. Uh, anyway, we are gonna <clears throat> talk a bit about that for the audience who are not reading the Discord now. Yeah, I'll take a, a two. I'll go fast. Um, so a lot of the questions were really about differences between, uh, between the displays, right? Because it's kind of a bold, bold claim to say uh, an optical see through or video see through is generally better than each other, right? So we try to be careful about the wording here and just focus on these two displays. But it raises still a lot of questions. Um, so some people in the uh, audience bring up the fact that optical see-through displays have an occlusion problem. Graphics are translucent. Could this have an effect? Um, which is a great segue because I'm giving a talk on the translucency of rendering uh, shadows uh, later today. You should come. Um, but also there's um, some other components that could be different, like the way they handle verges accommodation, which we do not measure. But also uh, my answer to that was, um, if we look at cutting vision, at least, and their, um, the way they've created a framework for studying depth perception and understanding it, virgins and accommodation are much more important at near distances. I think that and then some other issues might also be why we have more variability in distance estimation results in near space, but that's a topic for another day. Um, <laughs> The other um, was about field of view. Um, so yes, the field of view of the display in this context means the actual field of view you have available, which could also be said as your field of vision. So the HoloLens 2 does not have a restricted field of view. It has um, full field of view, right? Um, which is what we're talking about in this study. Also, the last question with Richard Paris about shadows um, is particularly relevant to today's paper session, Chair, because um, he asked about um, how does the angle of a shadow influence people's judgments and can that have an effect? 
to which the answer is yes. Um, and prior work by Gawit Al and Etienne Pelliard actually looked at this. And so what we do in this study is we look at drop shadows. Um, this is also kind of convenient because a lot of people in this space use drop shadows because they work really well. And it's just, it's so much easier to compare trends across people's results with that point of comparison, especially if we know from this prior research that it can have an effect. Ah, I'm done. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so thank you for the, uh, the summary and for the audience. You can also check the um, Discord channel if you want details. And we have just one minute. I have the uh, last question for you, Haley. Uh, because you asked, you opened your, your, your talk with the question, it was, um, what's the better, the best display between OST and VST and what's your final, final answer? Ooh, I, as a researcher, cannot make that, uh, as bold of a statement as I would like, but there's thus far, there's a lot of evidence that things like field of view and weight of an HMD are influencing. Uh, people's depth judgments. It's also kind of interesting if you look at the, if you take a review of the literature that's been done, um, particularly like if you look at augmented reality optical see-through displays, you have a lot of these studies that evaluate distance judgments to virtual targets. And then video see-through, you have a lot of studies that look at distance judgments to real world targets, um, which also complicates comparisons. But I think that also leads into an issue where people realize that there is some kind of distortion in depth perception. Um, happening there, even without the introduction of virtual objects. If you put on a video see-through display and you try to reach something, you're probably going to be off a little bit, which is uh, actually a really similar phenomenon to what you experience if you ever do a prism adaptation, where things are deliberately shifted. That's the whole paradigm. They shift things, you miss, you recalibrate. That's the paradigm. But there's a lot of physical properties going on, right? Like um, even beyond what we've mentioned today, there's a physical displacement between your eyes and the cameras of the display, um, which is a misalignment. And there's also cameras can introduce, introduce optical aberrations. So for multiple reasons, my short answer is I, there's a lot of evidence working um, against video see-through displays for accurate perception. That being said, there's that's not to say they're worse. Um, and obviously a lot more research needs to be done to actually confirm that, um, but yeah. Okay, thank you for this answer. Um, we'll switch to our next uh, presentation, next speech, speaker, Alexander Marquardt. So I saw also Discord, in Discord that you already elaborated on the, um, the question of Kyoshi Kyokawa, which was, what's next? So can you just tell us what uh, Yes, next? there's actually like mm -hmm. a ton of things we would like to do what's going on next with that uh, particular project. So I think the very obvious thing, which is like uh, coming next is that we currently only support like uh, horizontal movements of AR objects. So we can um, know only the spatial information of horizontal movements. So uh, what we want to do definitely next is like to, uh, to support all different kinds of trajectories from all different directions with that proximity and transition cues. And what is what will be like um, particularly useful would be um, like multiple target tracking to do with it because we just uh, tried it like now uh, with only one uh, single uh, object tracking. Um, yes, and um, also we want to uh, encode like the um, location of the uh ar object um with tactile feedback like more detailed and this needs to um require like some more work in um um uh, encoding it with um the location with duration frequency amplitude um such things so yes and uh, like finally we would like to uh, include like um, eye tracking uh, features to to support and um, enhance like the effectiveness uh, of, of of visual and non-visual guidance metaphors. Thank yes. you, <laughs> thank you for this answer. We have yeah we have a bit of the, so I can use my question also um, because I have a question. You already uh, only in in your work you deal about incoming notification and how do you think that you system can be used for act for the opposite when when the the participant want or need to look to something which is out of view um like guidelines uh, or searching out of view items 
Uh, pardon, I, I did not did not understand. Pardon. Do you, th do you think that we can use uh, your system, your proposal, to not for incoming notification, mm -hmm. but for when the the, particip the participant and the one to is looking for something? I mean, uh, for actual searching from the participant to the ex the out of view uh, items. Uh, this is actually the 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 objective of of like to to get. Uh, I know uh, I, I know now like uh, like actual guidance. Yeah. Yeah yeah yeah. This is uh, like uh, our also our previous work was uh, in this direction, like to use this uh, kind of uh, um, directional cues to to guide the person to a specific target location as well. Okay. And like, uh, what is also like interesting is to, to combine these two features, like uh, uh, guiding the person with uh, multisensory cues and also like raising awareness at the same time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your answer. Um... And we'll need we'll switch to our next presentation and next speaker. Uh, so I meant to say, <clears throat> Arifin, So I see that you also already answered yes. the question of Jesse on Discord. So the question was, um, what would happen if you use a focal free display, uh, such as yes. retinal scanning? So can you elaborate on the answer? <laughs> oh, okay. So it's it's very interesting questions like focal free displays, and uh, so the question, the thing is like, it's still there will be context switching. The thing is that context switching exists. So this is going to be the uh, yeah, display interface issues there. Uh, and the better the use uh, that can be answered with that effect. But the, the when we consider the accommodation and virgins, then focal free display it has the accommodation, accommodative virgins, and it still have the uh, the things of, uh, it brings the accommodation and virgins disparity and the disparity of stereo disparity. So it is very difficult to say, but uh, in future, maybe we could consider that and uh, see that the method we have already used in two experiments. And if the first one is Gabor Meron-Swan and the this experiment, uh, that could be answered those things. And maybe in future in that uh, retinal display could be used to, to replicate the experiment again. Okay, thank you. And um, yeah. what do you think about? I have another question. So, oh, yeah, question sure, is, what sure, do you sure. think about the um, uh, fixed accommodation plan? I mean, for usual um, AR display, the, the accommodation plan is fixed. And what will be the, the effect of that and the, 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 the use of your yes. results? Yeah. Um, Oh, that's a good question. That's a great question. But uh, the current modern AI display, they have a, they have the main issue of accommodation and virgins mismatch. So if you think of a Microsoft Hololens or uh, Hololens One and Hololens Two, it ha they have fixed accommodations. So their focal distance is basically fixed. So the thing is, if we can display the information at different distances, which is a, with a virgins and a mismatch of virgins accommodation and with the disparity virgins at different distances, so our assumption is that, or my assumption is that it could reduce the performance more because the display we used is an air haploscope. It has a no mismatch of accommodation versions. We have the capability of provide changing the focal distance dynamically. So we change the lens, change the focal distance, provide the information with appropriate accommodation and virtues. And we get these things. But if we consider a modern thing, modern air displays, which is currently available, it is still suffering from virtuous accommodation conflict that would further reduce the performance I, based on the optical configuration they have currently now. So that's my uh, assumption on based on the research we did. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And yeah, we can go for our we have a couple of minutes for our last speaker, uh, Volkant Andreas Meringer. So we have a lot of questions, in fact. Um, maybe the first one uh, from Bobby Bodenheimer who asked details about the task. Uh, were the balls actually moving or so? How do you know that so it didn't dominate the findings of opposed binocular disparity? Yeah, so um, the balls were moving, that's uh, correct. So they are always um, moving towards the user um, in some kind of, of yeah, tennis game manner, um, if we would like to call this in that way. And um, so the, the effect of tau should be minimized because 
basically they have the the same um, uh, the same size always. So it shouldn't be it, it, there should be no relative um, between them, and so they uh, are of course um, uh, in the same size, so that tau shouldn't be um, yeah dominating this this task. Okay, a new question from Ed Swan. Uh, why was only reaction time examined? I mean, why do the dually? So we thought about um, a lot of data. So we also thought about um, uh, having eye tracking uh, involved um, just to have some kind of clue about their search strategy and um, the position, for example, of the, the record. So it could also be interesting to just um, track the position of the record because at some point in time, I believe there, there will be a very straight movement towards one of these walls. And uh, you could, for example, um, train a classification algorithm that tells you um, at a certain point in time, when already the balls were visible, um, you have this uh, straight movement um, to kind of like perhaps distinguish between a real perception time and a movement time. Um, but in the end, we wanted to have a, a really um, comprehensive tool for um, Ampliopes to see their achievements. And that's why we decided to have um, uh, the accuracy. So um, how many times they were correct um, for each trial and um, of course, the reaction time, because we um, saw in literature that um, for if you become better, so if you have this training, you will, of course, also respond faster. And the accuracy is, is uh, also something that will increase. And so the, the let's say the, the best um, uh, data to, to really um, monitor the, the um, yeah, the training effect is, first of all, the accuracy and the reaction time. Okay, thank you. A uh, new question from my uh, What? Was, um, yeah, how much do you think that this stereoscopy task could improve the eyesight of the people who might be tested? And, and I, I would say, did you actually test your system on people suffering from um, amnioplar? Not yet, yeah. But it's, it's a very um, um, individual thing. So there is an improvement and sometimes it's a very uh, large improvement. And it's not only, um, uh, let's say the stereo acuity. So the minimum, uh, the minimal uh, uh, disparity difference um, uh, one can, can resolve, but it's also the visual acuity that um, uh, improves. And so um, it is uh, literature just shows that um, uh, um, the visual acuity and the stereo acuity can improve. And how also the, the extent is, of course, then an individual manner. OK, thank you. And last question from Kyoshi Kyokawa. Um, do you think that varifocal display be useful for the, the for treating uh, ablopia, ablopia? And through this problem, is not only the adjustment of vergence, but also the one of accommodation? I think it's, uh, it is highly relevant, um, especially for the uh, anisometromic um, uh, amblyopics. So uh, the ones uh, that uh, suffer the um, um, uh, refraction error, basically. Um, and this would be definitely um, a, a good thing to, to add. Yeah. The current um, research is also um, focusing no, I, I wouldn't say it's focusing, uh, but um, there are a lot of studies um, um, focusing on the strabismic patients. And uh, there are, of course, um, also studies on, on anisometromic um, amblyopes. But um, as I saw, it's not that many. Thank you. And that was the last question, and we are just on time. So. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all the speakers for this very interesting presentation and the, the answer to the question. Obviously, you can still use the Discord channel to exchange about the, this presentation. And I hope everyone will enjoy the remaining of the conference. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.